putting more accessible, you know, in this age of, uh, you know, the coronavirus. Uh, but there was, a, there was there was pushback, which has me nervous. And, you know, I'm not into conspiracy th uh, theories. Uh, we have a president who does that enough for all of us. But, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I there, there is a growing uh, fear that, uh, you know, that if this continues, that the president will try to find a way to screw around with the elections. Um, and we all know what the Constitution says. We're all, you know, uh, we all adhere to the constitutional principles, uh, but he may not. Um, and then what do you do then? Um, and given the makeup of the courts, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots to be concerned about our democracy, as Latasha said, and we need to, we, we, we need to make sure that the people can vote and that everybody who's eligible to vote has that right to vote. Our next question is from Lily. Welcome, Lily. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening. My name is Lily Tong, and I am an incoming student at Harvard Kennedy School from Toronto, Canada. Uh, Latasha, I need a ticket to your concert after this. Uh, but first of all, I have two questions. So the first one is that um, given that lockdowns have proven to be effective in China, what are the factors preventing municipalities from enacting a lockdown to contain the spread? And the second one is, how does the short-term economic loss during a lockdown measure up to the long-term economic paralysis resulting from prolonged lack of drastic measures? Well, Congressman, can we ask you to take that in terms of kind of working with so many elected officials, I'm sure, in your district? How are you observing them? Well, I mean, you know, one is that uh, some states have taken um, greater measures than, than others. Uh, look, here, here's what we, we need to do. And that goes for governors, presidents, congresspeople, you name it, everybody. You, gotta, you know, we got to listen to the scientists. We got to listen to the, uh, the best medical advice. Uh, and we ought to look at what's working in other parts of the world. And I think what we're learning is that, you know, kind of strong measures, uh, you know, up front uh, can help contain this virus, can help flatten the curve that we all hear about every day. And, uh, and so, I mean, I'm, I, you know, and, and some of us have whiplash here because a couple of weeks ago, the president told us this is a hoax. Not that he told us we're fighting a war. Uh, and then the other day he said, I want the churches filled on, on Easter. So, I mean, you know, what he ought to be saying is that I'm going to listen to the best medical advice. I'm going to listen to the science. I'm going to do what is in the interest of the American people to save lives. And you can't save an economy if you don't save lives. And if, uh, if we were to um, somehow, you know, relax some of these restrictions or say, ah, what the, what the heck? You know what? We may find ourselves back in another another moment where we have to lock down again, and this time our economy won't be able to come back. So yeah, this is that's why we're you know we're we're taking strong measures in Congress, the largest relief package in the history I think of our country. We're moving forward, you know, to try to keep people afloat until this passes. But uh, uh, but you know we we need to listen to the science and local and governors. By the way, uh, you know they can decide what they want for their states. It'd be nice if we had a president that you know, we do that and work in conjunction with our governors, but uh, we don't have that luxury right now. Uh, our next student, uh, Latasha, did you want to add anything to that? Okay, our next student is Kezia, who has a question for both of you. Kezia? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kezia, I'm a senior at the college. Uh, my question is hopefully gonna uh, sort of end on a positive note. I'd love to hear what you think is going really well in the political process uh, and maybe share some bright spots that mm. you're seeing or hoping for out of this. Nice. Well, I think, you know, one positive thing is that the Senate voted 97 to nothing on a bill. Um, you can't get 97 senators to agree on what to have for lunch. And yet they came together and, uh, and voted for, quite frankly, you know, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you know, an imperfect product. I mean, for me, it doesn't go as far as it should go. It, it doesn't it, it devote enough resources to the most vulnerable in our in our in our country. Uh, for Republicans, you know, you know, it goes too far in a lot of areas. So, uh, the, but I think people know the urgency of this moment and know we don't have a lot of time to screw around. So people came together. Um, the the other thing I'm going to tell you that I, I see is I see the goodness in the American people. Um, you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm hearing. You know, in my district, I'm hearing all around the place, people, you know, checking on their neighbors, you know, when they go food shopping, buying food for an elderly neighbor or somebody who they know have a compromised immune system. I mean, you know, just checking in on everybody um, and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, and supporting our local businesses, buying gift cards and, and, and buying takeout just to, 
to keep these businesses afloat. So, you know, um, you know, there's some good things happening. Um, but I, uh, but I, I, but I think we, we don't want to fool ourselves uh, into a false sense of security that uh, the political love fest um, is going to continue, um, you know, forever. Because um, you know, some of the things we're going to have to do in terms of investment, you know, may be, may, 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 uh, may be, uh, may incur some some very uh, intense debate. Uh, so we have to be prepared for that. Natasha. So I think one, I think the biggest piece, and I always talk about the radical reimagining of America that, you know, I think one of the things is we are right for change right now. You know, change doesn't happen until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. And so I say that because I think in this particular moment, I, I'm hoping that this health crisis allow us to really examine that if 32 million people are not without health insurance, that we realize how interdependent we are as human beings, that the health of somebody else actually impacts the health of us, right? And so that we can have a real dialogue and a more open dialogue around healthcare in this country. I'm hoping that in this moment, as we're looking at this crisis, right, that we really and we see the holes in democracy, that what comes out of this is a real commitment for how we've got to strengthen democracy so that we can, in fact, become um, this, this belief around American, the, uh, American idealism becomes real. I believe that we're in this moment now that we're actually, I can tell you, I'm actually helping to teach my, um, my uh, kindergarten child, and I have so much respect for teachers. I think teachers should get paid a billion dollars a year, right? And so my point, I think that, right? I think I'm hoping that in this moment that there is a, a different kind of focus on the, the, the significance and the impact of education in this country. And so I think that there's some core pieces that we're all forced to deal with that we haven't really been dealing with. We just kind of been looking at them as like headlines and newspaper that we're forced to deal with right now that would actually shape a new, a stronger America coming out of this. Well, Jim and Latasha, we can't thank you enough for those uh, words of inspiration to end on, but for your lives that you've led in public service and a commitment to the public good. Um, struck, uh, you're both valued friends. And Latasha, I love your Harvard sweatshirt and your patriotic uh, bill calling us from Atlanta. We and got cool spirit. I, yes. And Jim, I love, I think you're in your dining room. I remember that painting oh, yeah. behind I, you. I, picture, I bought that uh, painting in Cuba. I remember. Uh, but, but, but uh, I wish I could sing like Natasha. I, I would I would open up uh, with a, with a song. But if I did, everybody would tune out. That's um, right. can, I, can I just say one thing about what Natasha said? I think is very very important. I mean, you know, this is a moment where people have to take this this democracy seriously. Where people really need to be engaged. And right. if we're going to have these discussions on expanding health care and on education and you know and supporting uh, those who are most vulnerable, we need to make sure that you're that we're, we're electing people and elevating people who actually share those values. Um, you know, when, when people complain about, you know, who serves in Congress or who serves in the, in the Senate, I always tell people, you know, people, we didn't get here by accident. People vo voted for us or didn't vote for us. And if you didn't vote, then you're part of, and you don't like who's there, you're part of the problem. So exactly. this, is a mo this is a moment to mobilize. Uh, if ever there was a moment, it is now. So happy to be with you. Be safe, everybody. Thank you so much. You've uh, allowed us to begin this uh, fast form, 30 minute dialogue. We'll continue it next week. NBC's Peter Alexander will be our guest uh, reflecting on his coverage uh, at the White House and the issues um, of the day. But you've start, you both have started us in, in wonderful ways and we're deeply grateful to you and, and excellent questions uh, from our students. Blake started us well and Kezia capped it off. She was an extraordinary chair of the forum committee as well. So thank you all, be safe everyone, stay healthy. And thank you so much from here at the Institute of Politics. Have a good night. Good night. Okay.